obviously, man, you're a, you're a professional and you're going to do things the right way. But with this one, man, with this being so close, was there any part of you that thought, I don't know that I need to be in the booth for this fight? You know, I, I've i always said no to calling my teammates fights. Um, but as I move into the second phase of my life, you know, I, I have to, it's my job. And it wasn't like a decision made, like, on a whim. It was a lot of people asking, can Daniel do this job? And for me, I've called Islam Makashev fights. I've called Deron Wynn fights. And I feel like I stayed down the middle as best as I could. And so I figured I could do it. It's tough, right? Because abu has been there for eight years now at AKA. And we've seen him rise from the very beginning. But I got a job to do. And that's what I'm going to do on Saturday. Nice. Look, I could. And here's another thing, right? Certain guys, if he fought, I couldn't do the job. I'm being honest. Like if I, but I respect Justin so tremendously that I can do the job with him calling Justin because I feel so. I, I like Justin so much. Yeah, it's hard to do it for someone that you know. Um, to call Khabib and Connor with all the bad blood, I couldn't have done that because you're so solely in your guy's corner. But Justin's a good guy. Well, since you're praising him there, I mean, and obviously you're going to be fair about this. I mean. Is he the toughest challenge of, of Habib's career? Because it seems like the guy that just has all the right tools mm -hmm. that could trouble Habib. I believe he's the toughest fight for Habib, you know, and for a long time. You know, we thought that Tony Ferguson was the guy that would give him the most trouble, if there is trouble to be had. But then obviously Justin Gaethje beat uh, Tony. And um, the guy that showed up there in May, I was like, wow, I just watched it, right? I was there. I was like, I just watched the most dangerous guy for Habib. With his wrestling ability and his striking ability, um, I believe that he's dangerous. But I, I, there's even something that stands out to me even more. It's the confidence. I mean, this dude believes that he's going to win. Like, there's no doubt in his mind. So I think Justin's mentality is what gives him uh, a big chance. So that's what gives Justin a chance. But with Habib, we know it's his wrestling, right? It's, just, it's incredible. I mean, obviously, the wrestling expert that you are, I mean, what is it about it, right? I mean, wrestling, tons of guys wrestle, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a martial arts been around forever. What is it about him that makes him so damn good at it? Well, his ability to continue to chase down takedowns, right? That's what it is. You know, like, he said something yesterday about me taking Stipe down once and then stopping because he got up. Well, he won't stop. He really will not stop. He'll continue to try to take you down until eventually you kind of go, okay, I'm going to accept being on my back. And when you accept being on your back, it's no good with him because he's so good at top control. Yeah. Then I want to ask you about outside of the cage. I mean, you know what it's like to be in the spotlight, right, and have all the pressure. Obviously, he's a global superstar, but I feel like here in particular, like the spotlight is super bright, mm -hmm. man. Can you talk about that? I mean, do you, do you think it's a more difficult place for him to fight because of the expectations of his time, of, of all the attention he's receiving in the lead to the fight? You know, when you think about Khabib in the Middle East, you understand that he's even, I mean, he's globally known. But here, it's like at a different level. Now, I would imagine last time he was here, it was much harder to deal with than this time. Because he's got about 10 guys with him, right? And those are the guys that stay in his circle, and they are available to him. Outside of media, nobody's in his face anymore. Could you imagine being here last year when he fought Dustin? And the fans, and him trying to go get some food, not being in a secure bubble. I think this is probably the ideal situation for Habib. But yeah, he's he's massive here. I mean, I think there are a number of reasons why, but he's 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 a big deal. Nice. Last thing for me, uh, as his teammate and as just a, a fight fan, uh, man, he wins this fight twenty nine zero. He's talked about thirty and zero. Book his fight, man. What's the right fight for thirty zero? Like, what's 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 the best next matchup for him? Should, should he win this in spectacular fashion? You know, the reality is like, the task at hand this Saturday is so great because Justin's so good, but if Habib is able to get past him and he's 29 and 0 looking at his retirement fight. I think it has to be St. Pierre, right? Like, that's the fight, right? Who doesn't think that? I mean, could you imagine the energy of a Habib versus George St. Pierre fight with fans? With fans. I mean, this would be the unbelievable athlete from the generation prior versus the unstoppable athlete from this prior. Uh, I don't know. Jim Ross said the immovable object versus the whatever unstoppable force. It would be that, right? It would be just like that. Um, it'd be tremendous. But I think it has, I think GSP, if, 
But I don't know, maybe a, a catchweight fight. Because Habib cuts a lot to get to 55, right? So if there's ever a fight that warrants a 165-ish area, that's uh, GSP and, and Habib. Danny, you mentioned uh, Gaethje's confidence coming into this fight. I mean, it does seem like he's very confident, but do you think it's inevitable? They all break. Does Justin break? See, I think that's why Justin's so dangerous, because he hasn't shown that he can break. He seems to thrive in that chaos, right? When it gets uglier and dirtier and more grimy, Justin's smiling, right? He's smiling. He's cut up. He's gotten dropped multiple times. Dude's smiling. So I believe that he believes that that won't happen to him. And we haven't seen it, so there's no reason for us not to believe what he's saying. When you say Habib will just continue to chase, uh, chase the take down and just transition, 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 is that just a him thing, or is that a difference in the way he's been taught wrestling and Americans get taught wrestling? You see, that's a... Uh, he's always been a good takedown guy. But before, he was just a takedown guy. Now his striking has gotten so much better. And I believe that that's not only a Habib thing, that's also an AKA thing. You know, remember Cain Velasquez? He chased 30 takedowns versus Junior Dos Santos or something. You know, these guys will chase takedowns on a ton of occasions, you know? I've had to get multiple takedowns in fights too, right? Where I just wrestled and wrestled and wrestled. And I think that we developed that in the in the gym. We have a drill where uh, we're wrestling different guys every minute for 15 minutes and they're trying to take you down or you're trying to take them down. It's like we build these drills to try to uh, have that ability to do that inside the fight. And I think uh, Habib just has taken it to the next level, right? We've seen it. I always say this about our gym in particular. Mike's, Bob Cook and those guys got to the UFC. Then Mike Swick, John Fitch, Josh Koscheck got the title fights. So they blew the ceiling off of what Bob and them had done. And then me, Kane, and Luke, we became champions, right? We didn't just get to the title fights. And we blew the ceiling again. And now who's, you got to have another guy that's going to come through and do something even greater. And that's what Habib has done. Not only in his global appeal, but also in the way that he fights in that same type of style, but he takes it to another, he just took it to another level. None of us got 22 takedowns in a fight. He got 22 takedowns. Like, I mean, if I got five, I was like, oh boy, I had to wrestle a lot tonight. You know, if I had to take somebody down five times, I'm like, that was a lot of wrestling. Kane attempted 30 takedowns, but he didn't get 20 of them, right? So, like, it's, a, it's, 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 one, of, it's one of the things that our gym really is known for. I wanted to ask you about another guy who's been at your gym, he's tied to the Vasu. Yeah, it's my boy right there. Yeah, I was going to ask, what's the banter <laughs> like between you two? I can sort of imagine you guys playing off each other. He's so funny. Ty to Vas is funny. He, you know what's crazy about Ty? Ty's in, in AKA training with us, and I mean, we're taking him down like you wouldn't believe it. He was like, man, he was like, I knew I came here for a reason, but I didn't expect it was going to be like this. I was like, bro. Every time you get up, we're on your legs. Like, we're just on his legs constantly trying to exhaust him to help him with that and help him not help him not accept being on his back. That's the one thing that kills Ty. In the last fight against the kid, was it Spivak or something like that? And um, the guy would take him down and Ty would accept guard. Why? Get up. Just get up. Let's see if he is able to do that, to do what Kane used to do or Habib does, where he has to take it down over and over again, not one around. One around is easy. So we kept taking him down and... It was, it was, he started to learn, and he started to get better, but then the pandemic hit. And guess what? I was with him when the pandemic hit. We were at my house on Ty's birthday, sparring in my garage before it was all complete and ready. We were just beating each other up in there. The news comes on. My wife goes, Daniel, they're about to shut down the state. So I run in the house, get in the shower. I'm like, Ty, we got to go. So Ty's like, oh, he's like, why, mate? Why? I go, bro, we got to go to the store and get food. He's like, why? I go, they're shutting down the state. So I'm like panicking, right? I dart out of the house. I get Ty into my truck. Or Ty gets in his car. I'm in my truck. He's staying. I go, what? He goes, what are, what are we supposed to do, mate? I go, get food. He goes, I'm staying in someone's house, mate. Because he was renting a room on Airbnb, right? I was like, you got to get as much food as you possibly can. So we get in the Safeway. Everything's like almost off the shelves. No toilet paper, no water. Why toilet paper? Like He was like, why toilet paper? I was like, I don't know, but just take paper towels. Like Get something, right? Get tissues. So... I'm like, and get a lot of meat because you're a big guy, right? Like, get a lot of meat. He goes, there's no meat. All the chicken's gone. Ty comes to the front of the, the, the checkout counter. I said, get whatever you want. I'll buy it. He comes to the checkout counter. Ty has like six massive things of corned beef. I was like, who eats this much corned beef? 
He had like freaking six, six pound corned beef. I was like, yo, you're going to eat all that corned beef. It's going to make you sick. I go, you got to get, just get meat. He's like, I like corned beef. I was like, but you don't like it that much. Like, this is corned beef for a week. And yeah, but we were like standing in there. They had 20 people in each line. He was like, this is the craziest thing I've ever seen. And then eventually uh, um, he left because of his son, right? He was like, DC, they're going to close Australia. He said, I got to go back. I was like, okay. I was like, I never said you have to, to stay. I was just trying to prepare you if you did, you know, like. If you did have to stay, you needed things and much more than corned beef. He's like, where's the rice? I was like, bro, no more rice in the store. Like, it was crazy. My local Safeway was, like, empty. Yeah, I was with Tai Tuivasa. He's, like, lost a couple, right? He's coming in this, the pressure's on. He admitted to us yesterday, uh, the other day, that it was an eye-opener coming to the AKA, probably because of the takedowns and everything. <laughs> Is he a talent? Is he a talent anyway? Have people forgotten? Are they underappreciated? He's very, Ty's very talented, right? But here's the thing, and it, it's just something he admitted to me himself. He didn't know. He said, I was kind of just freestyling this thing. So to go 3-0 and in the UFC without really knowing how to fight, how to grapple, how to do, that's insane that he was able to do that. That speaks to his talent, right? It speaks to his courage. But you need more than that. You need actual skill. And I think that he was able, he's been able to kind of develop that. Last thing for me, you know how when you speak to Khabib, you take on a broken Russian accent? Yes. Or to Thai, do you take on like a weird Australian accent? I mean, Ty is so out there, man. Have you hung out with Ty at all? I've He's the best. He's the best, bro. Like, you don't need to pick up anything. You can barely, like, yeah, he, no, I talk to him normal. He's the best. <laughs> I like Ty, though. He's funny, man. He's funny. He's a funny, funny guy. I think that Justin is, again, you find motivation in different things, right? He finds his motivation in representing our country because Abib is Russian, right? He is Russian, right? So he's like, it feels like Rocky IV, and I love that dynamic. I love that he is making that a part of the story because that makes a lot of the American fans go, you know what? But I got to tell you one thing about, about, about that. That does not matter as much as you would expect. I was at... I don't know where Anderson fought Chris Weidman the first time, but I was there, right? I was there, filled, filled to the brims with the American pride, red, white, and blue, USA with flags on the, on the set where I'm not supposed to. And Chris Weidman came out, and they booed him in Las Vegas. <laughs> and Anderson Silva came out, and they cheered him like he was the American guy. It does not matter that much in our, our, our sport. It doesn't. So if it's for Justin, it's great. But Anderson got cheered. Chris got booed in Las Vegas. It might have been, it may as well have been Rio de Janeiro. <laughs> Sorry. Michael Chandler was actually going off that. Michael Chandler did a media day too. And he said when there were rumors of him possibly fighting Islam, his DMs just blew up with mm -hmm. outstanding fans. So what is it about those fans that they get so intense when it comes to their fighters? Well, I mean... It's Dagestan. I mean, you been there? Yeah. I have. <laughs> they're, they're not doing all that much over there, you know. <laughs> they're learning to fight and wrestle. You know, I wrestled there. Them dudes can all wrestle. You know, they're like, you know, they're not hanging out, like going to the movies. Like, they're wrestling and they're fighting, right? They're with their family. So, yeah, it's Dagestan. I love it. I love it. Now, let's not take it like I hate Dagestan, but there's not much to do. So when a guy like Islam, who's so well-known, Gets an opportunity to fight on the same card as Habib and Umar, right? Because Umar was supposed to fight too. They're like, wow, this is like a freaking... This is like Chicago when the Bulls were the best. Or this would be L.A. right now, you know, like going crazy because the Lakers won. But yeah, it's Dagestan, and they're very loyal to their guys. And one final one, a lot of the narrative has been like Dagestan versus U.S. wrestling, but what do you make of the striking between the two? Because Casey said Habib's incredibly underrated. Mm-hmm. He does have a good jab. You saw him control Al Quinta with a jab, right? He controlled Al. When he couldn't take Al down as easy as he wanted to, he just controlled him with a jab. He has a really good jab. But if you talk about stand-up strike, Justin Gaethje is the better striker. Overall, he's the better striker. Do I feel Khabib can hold his own there? Yes. But Gaethje is the better overall striker. Much more comfortable there. Much more confident and hits harder. You know, so... uh yeah, Habib does have the ability to stand up. People do underrated striking. 
There was a video that came out a few weeks ago from him fighting Kamal Shalarus, and he was just taking all these bad shots and kind of dump dumb. Those days are way in the past. He's a much more competent striker today than he was back then. You taught him his jab. I taught him the jab. That's my jab. <laughs> I was like, because we used to just stand there trying to punch each other in the face with a jab. Oh, 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 that's a jab, DC. I'm like, yeah, you got me with that one. But we just constantly, we just keep throwing the jab. Javier. Javier, actually. <laughs> Showed me too. Javier did. Yeah. DC over here. I actually want to look ahead a bit to next week. We have Anderson Silva in his last fight. I mean, you're a guy who's fought him. I mean, can you just talk about at now at the end of his career, what's it like for you to say that you've got to add one of the goats, you know, to your resume? Man, when I saw that, I got to admit, like, I, I kind of had, like, a... It was a bit like... I was kind of taken back. Like, ah, it's finally going to be done for Anderson. You know, it kind of sucked, right? Like, everybody hoped that he would be done prior. But now that you watch him fight, and you know, like... It, you, I still get that thing, right? When his song comes on, and I hope he comes out to his song instead of his son's song like last time. It's just too different, right? Like, keep the DMX song. It It, it is, like who you are and you still get that excitement when because it's Anderson so kind of sucks that he's going to be done but all of our time comes right you can only hold on for so long and Anderson realizes that so it's over but yeah it was, it was phenomenal to compete against him and and get a victory it's nerve wracking though very it really is doesn't matter how long he's had to train you look across the octagon and there's Anderson Silva and you are taken back to Philadelphia when he bought, fought Stefan Bonner or uh, Forrest Griffin, and it was my first UFC ever. And I'm in the stands, and I see Anderson hit the curtain, and people go crazy. And I and on the on the camera is, is Roy Jones because he wants to fight him. When Roy Jones is everything that every young black man thought of as boxing, so you knew that this guy was next level star, right? You're taken back to that the moment you stand across the octagon with him, especially for me. Now you've been a part of Habib's career. You've obviously you know been tied to John Jones. You have Anderson Silva. Where do you put him on that list of, you know, these top guys? All Man, time? listen, I think Anderson is one of the mo the greatest fighters of all time. But I do stand firm in what I say. You know, you cannot have bad tests. You can't have bad tests and be considered the best of all time. It's just the way it is. You can't have bad tests. It does not matter what it is. It does not matter what the excuse or reason. You can't have bad tests because so many of us don't, Right? If everybody was having bad tests, okay, I get it. But there are a lot of guys that have reached the highest level of the sport without having bad tests. So he will always stand amongst the greatest. But it's hard to, uh, it's really hard to give anyone that distinction if they have bad tests. When Mike, Michael Chiesa was here before, he was talking a little bit about his face off with Hamza Chimaev. And you actually wrestled him. How did it all happen? You guys were in the same restaurant? So I have this thing, right? When I see a Russian guy, I wrestle him. So that's pretty much all it is. Like, oh, you're Russian, you know how to wrestle. Right? They do every time they wrestle me. So I grab them by the arm, they start to defend, and I start to defend, and we end up wrestling. So that's what Lene asked me yesterday. She goes, I saw Habib for the first time a couple days ago. I gave him a hug, and oh, I miss you. And he's like, I miss you. And then immediately, into the wrestling. <laughs> because that's what we do. She's like, do you guys just wrestle when you see each other? I said, every time. We could be, if I was to be walking in the middle of Times Square, and I see a guy with a bit of a square head like Habib and him. You know, they all have that square head. I'm like, oh, this dude's a wrestler. And I'll go grab him. And we'll probably start wrestling in the middle of Times Square. It's just the way it is. And also, the last time you were here, we spoke about uh, Hamzat's teammate, Guram. And you said you promised you're going to learn his last name if he's going to win. Yep. So how, were you impressed with his performance? I was. And I knew his last name on Saturday because I said it so much. But now I can't say it anymore. Uh, but, yeah, I thought he did good. I thought he was hard on himself. But I was also very impressed with his opponent. Um, Gamrock. Gamrock, yeah. yeah. They, 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 um, Guram started the fight so impressively. But then Gamrock actually worked his way back into that fight. That's why uh, Guram was so disappointed. Because in the second round, in the third round, I felt like it was uh, Gamrock's fight, right? So, and when you're a fighter and you're in there, and those last 15 minutes, those last 10 minutes pass, and you're getting taken down over and over again, you start to feel that too. I thought he did good, though. For a guy taking a fight on short notice, fighting an undefeated fighter, I thought he did well. There was also a funny moment when you bumped into the camera. Maybe it wasn't 
Like, yeah, it was bad. At that moment. That was me. Maybe, 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 I, maybe when Gamrod fought at that point and um, Guram fought, I was still concussed from the camera. It was like turn face. For, that happened three times. It happened three times. But it was my fault, actually. I was mad at the cameraman initially, but it was actually my fault. I guess I'm supposed to interview from the opposite side and then go behind the fighter. And then I look and I, I saw Rogan, and he always does. Rogan immediately turns and goes behind the fighter. So I was like, wow, it's my fault. I was like, you got to stop standing so close to me. And he's, like, <laughs> he's like, dude, you're supposed to. I was like, oh, all right, my bad. Any other questions? Just because you mentioned his name, Roy Jones Jr. and Mike Tyson. Mm -hmm. excited you watching? How did you see it going? Am I wa I mean, who's not watching? Like, who's not watching Roy Jones and Mike Tyson? This is going to be one of the biggest pay-per-views of the year. I can't wait. It's going to be, I'm going to try to go there. If they let people in the arena, I'm there. If they let people in the arena, I'm there. I don't care what my role is. I want to be a part of that pay-per-view. And to be clear, if somebody sees you on the street, it's okay to try to take you down, but not to say, I bet I could take you down. Don't say you can. Don't bet me, but try. <laughs> if you bet me now, we got a lifetime rivalry. <laughs> bet me. I bet I can take you down. Don't do that. Hey, listen, listen. Also, listen. <laughs> listen, listen, listen. Let me just say this. I'm a much different man today than I was in 2010, right? I had just finished wrestling. I, I get taken down all the time now. You got to remember, back before I fought Jones, I, I didn't give up a takedown through like 15 fights. But now, I mean, I've probably given up five in my career, but that's a lot, right? But, um, yeah, I've given up some takedowns. Back then, I felt like it was impossible for any fighter to take me down until Alexander Gustafson did it twice, and I was like, whoa, what is going on here? Right, so yeah, I can get you can say that whatever you want. I'm an old man now. I'm retired. <laughs> say whatever you want. I ain't fighting. 